We live at a <coughs> rather challenging moment of history when the society in which we live threatens to disintegrate and there seem to be forces working hard to ensure that that would happen. Wokeism or the critical race theory is just one example of this. But to our sorrow and shame, the Church of Jesus Christ has been characterized by fragmentation for generations. Thank you, brother. Cup of cold water in the name of the Lord. And so it is quite appropriate that we ask ourselves, how many churches does Christ have? This was a major issue in Paul's day. It played a very, very large part in his ministry for one simple reason. It has to do with the very essence of the gospel. It really touches on a simple but very important question. Is salvation by works or is it by grace? Uh, I hope we'll see the connection between these as, uh, as we proceed. Realizing the importance of the matter, Satan does see it. He's labored hard and long to divide the Church of Christ. And to no small extent, he's been embarrassingly successful. And so let's see what God's word has to say about this topic this morning. And before we do, let's turn to the Lord in prayer. Our God and Father, we have no light but the light that you choose to shed. We have no knowledge but that which you choose to impart. Our truths are all lies. Your truth is very truth. And therefore we come to you. Grant us light. Teach us your truth. Shape and move our hearts by your word. We ask that you will glorify yourself by so doing. And we ask it not because we deserve it, but because you deserve to be glorified. And we ask it in the name of Jesus, our Savior. Amen. Turn with me, if you please, to Ephesians chapter 2. We'll begin reading at verse 8. Ephesians chapter 2, verse 8. It is by grace that you have been saved through faith. And this, that is your salvation by grace through faith, is not of yourselves. It is the gift of God, not of works, so that no one can boast. For we are God's handiwork, created in Christ Jesus to do good works, which God prepared in advance for us to do. Therefore, remember, re note this, therefore, therefore, remember that formerly you who are Gentiles, that's most of you folk here this morning, Gentiles by birth and called uncircumcision by those who call themselves the circumcision, which is done in the body by human hands, that's Bracha and myself and Shlomit today. Remember that at the time you were separate from Christ, excluded from the citizenship in Israel, and foreigners to the covenants of the promise, without hope and without God in the world. But, but now in Christ Jesus, you who were once a far away have been brought near by the blood of Christ. For he is our, not yours, but our peace, who has made the two into one and has destroyed the barrier, the dividing wall of hostility, by setting aside in his flesh the law with its commands and regulations. His purpose was to create in himself one new humanity out of the two, thus making peace. Peace. 
and in one body to reconcile both of them, Jew and Gentile, to God through the cross, by which he put to death their hostility, one to another and together to God. He came and preached peace to you, Gentiles, who were far away, and peace to those who were near, for through him we both have access to the Father by one Spirit. Consequently, you'll be glad to hear, you are no longer foreigners and strangers, but fellow citizens with Shlomit and Bracha and myself, God's people and also members of his household, built on the foundation of the apostles and prophets with Christ Jesus himself, the chief cornerstone, in whom the whole building is joined together and rises to become a holy temple in the Lord. And in him, you too are being built together to become a dwelling in which God lives by his Spirit. We pass over these familiar passages without really taking note of what they're saying. Largely because we're, we're more occupied with what the text might say to us than what the text might actually be saying. I hope you notice the connection between salvation by grace and the joining together into one. There's a logic there. We find it also in Paul's words in the same book in chapter 1 verses 9 to 13. He made known to us the mystery of his will, that is God made known to us the mystery of his will, according to his good pleasure which he set forth in him, that is in Christ, regarding his plan for the fullness of times. God has a plan for the fullness of times. So what is that plan? To bring all things together in Christ, things in heaven and things on earth. In him we also have obtained an inheritance, having been predestined according to the purpose of him who works all things according to the plan of his will, to the end that we who were the first to hope in the Christ, who are those? Who are the first to hope in the Christ? Come on, folk. Shlomit and Bracha and myself. That we would be to the praise of his glory. In him you also. Who are they? All the rest of you guys. In whom you also having, uh, have, after listening to the message of truth, the gospel of your salvation, having also believed, you were sealed in him with the Holy Spirit of promise. So here is God's plan for the fullness of time. To bring all things together in Christ. Quite the opposite of the trend of which we are now so cognizant. To that end, both Jews and Gentiles are brought together and sealed, Paul says, with the Holy Spirit of promise. It is on the grounds of that understanding of God's purpose for the fullness of times, this grand goal that God has, that Paul considered it necessary for him to constantly insist, as he did when he wrote to the Galatians, for example, and says, there's neither Jew nor Gentile, male or female, bond or free. Now, we need to recognize that there were real tensions in the days uh, of the apostles. I'm not sure we all want to go back to those apostolic times. And those tensions were so real and so practical that just about in every one of Paul's letters he makes either direct or indirect reference to them. Now, they all had to do with the unity of the body of Christ. From a Jewish perspective, it had to do with the relationship between Jews and Gentiles. From a Roman perspective, it had to do with status. Are you a noble or, or a commoner? Are you a citizen or are you a non-citizen? Are you a, a slave or are you a slave owner? Are, are you a, a male or are you female? From a Christian perspective, none of those distinctions mattered. <laughs> 
And therefore, Paul devoted his ministry to a very large extent to the promotion of this very point. Laboring for the unity of the body of Christ. And most of his sufferings were consequent to that emphasis. So that it wasn't just that Paul suffered for the gospel, which of course is true, but for a particular consequence of the gospel, the unity of the body of Christ. Because as far as he was concerned, any division within the body of Christ is in fact a denial of the gospel. Now that's worth repeating. As far as Paul is concerned, lack of unity in Christ among those who truly belong to him, regardless of the reason for that lack, is a denial of the gospel. Because our unity in Christ touches upon the very essence of what the gospel is. It raises this simple but important question. Is salvation by grace or by works? By grace or theological exactitude? Paul believed that Christian unity in the very teeth of differences is a demonstration of the gospel. He believed that the gospel runs contrary to the grain of divisions between those who are in Christ because the gospel runs against the grain of any kind of distinctions between people. So long as they are in Christ, it doesn't matter what their social or racial or gender or sexual, and forgive me if, as far as I'm concerned because the Bible says so, those two, sex and gender, are synonymous. And if you don't forgive me, that's all right. I forgive you. <laughs> for example, Paul weaves his argument for unity into the very fabric of his letter to the Romans, in which he is really presenting his gospel to the scrutiny of a church which he hopes to visit. Let me try to show this to you. In chapters 1 to 3 of his letter to the Romans, Paul insists that all Jews and Gentiles have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. All Jews and Gentiles. In chapter 2, he tells us that God will render to each one, Jew or Gentile, according to his works. There will be tribulation and distress for every human being who does evil, the Jew first, and then also the Greek. But glory, honor, and peace for everyone who does good, the Jew first, and also the Greek. And the reason for this, Paul tells us, as he carries on his argument, is that God shows no partiality. In other words, no distinctions are allowed. No differences are taken into account. In chapter 4, he insists that the blessing of salvation again extends, he says, to all including the uncircumcised. Aren't you glad? In chapter 5, he shows us why. Because Jesus is the new Adam, the head of a new humanity, a new Israel composed of Jews and of Gentiles. Not a new Calvin, the head of a new Presbyterianism, nor a new Roger, the head of a Baptist movement. No, no, no. A new humanity a new Israel. And so he tells us that it is not only to the adherents of the law, but also to the one who shares the faith of Abraham, be he Jew or Gentile, because Abraham is the father of us all, he says. As it is written, I have made you the father not of one, but of many nations. And then in chapter 6, he goes on to lay an equal burden on Jews and Gentiles in Christ. And then in chapter 7, seven he shows the struggle that both Jews and Gentiles in Christ have because they continue to fall short of the glory of God. There is an important reason why Paul is, insists on this all. Because he tells us that salvation depends on grace through faith so that the promise may rest on grace and be guaranteed to all. Again, Romans. 
he then specifies not only to the adherent of the law, once again, but also to the one who shares the faith of Abraham. And so in chapter 5, he tells us that all are the subject of continuing grace. In chapter 6, he tells us that all are not subject to law, but to grace. And all are to receive one another on the same grounds, a passage to which I will return a little later. On the same grounds in which Christ welcomed them to the glory of God. And that is why Paul spells out the practical terms in chapters 12 to 16. Let me just remind you of some of the passages there and see again how Paul is insisting upon inclusiveness. Except the one who is weak in faith. Now, who is that? I know. It's the other guy. It always is the other person, isn't it? Okay, says Paul. He's playing a trick on us here. He says, okay, you're the one that's strong in faith. Doesn't matter what your view is. You think you're strong in faith? Except the one who is weak in faith, but... Let's not judge one another anymore, but rather determine not to put an obstacle or a stumbling block in a brother's way. We who are strong ought to bear the weaknesses of those without strength and not please ourselves. Accept one another just as Christ has accepted us. And I urge you, brothers, by our Lord Jesus Christ and by the love of the Spirit, to strive together, together, together with me in your prayers to God. Now I've referred to this except one another. This is Romans 15 verse 7 and it bears comment. Uh, the Greek word there is more properly translated to or unto rather than for. That is to say that we are to admit one another into our fellowship just as Christ accepted us, unworthy sinners though we are, into the glory of God. He did not wait until we met his expectations and were thereby suited to the kingdom. He received us on the grounds of grace, by which grace he has ever since gradually changing us by his spirit from glory to glory into his own beautiful image. And he does so precisely by first accepting us. And so as Paul draws his letter to the Romans to a close in chapter 15, he makes much of the fact that God's gracious intentions always included the other nations, the Gentiles. He says in Chapter 15, verses 8 to 9, immediately after calling upon his readers to accept one another as Christ has received them into the glory of God, he says, I tell you that Christ became his servant to the circumcised to show God's truthfulness or faithfulness in order to confirm the promises given to the patriarchs, which is that the Gentiles might glorify God for his grace. He then seals the letter with an exhortation to which I've referred and I will refer again. I appeal to you, brothers, to watch out for those who cause what? Divisions and create obstacles contrary to the doctrine you have taught, that is to say, the gospel. Avoid them, for such persons do not serve our Lord Jesus Christ, but their own appetites. And then, in face of the tensions which inevitably face them in their mixed congregation, mixed as all congregations ought to be, having assured them that God will shortly crush Satan under their feet, he signs off with a word of praise to God in Christ, and yet this time in an intimated way, reference once again to unity. Now to him who is able to strengthen you in the plural, according to my gospel, and the preaching of Jesus Christ, according to the revelation of the mystery, remember what we read about that mystery, that was kept secret for long ages, but has now been disclosed through the prophetic writings, has been made known to all nations, according to the command of the eternal God, to bring about among all nations the obedience of faith, 
And therefore, to the only wise God be glory forevermore through Jesus Christ. Amen. In other words, they are to obey the gospel. They being, again, Jews and Gentiles, by maintaining the unity of the body in a bond of peace. No differentiation is to be allowed. They are to live out the gospel in the context of their differences. And they are to do so within the framework of the one church to which they all belong. Now, I could easily make that case from just about every one of Paul's letters. Paul repeatedly insists that unity in Christ issues out of and touches upon the very essence of the gospel. And that grace must be the basis of Christian fellowship because it is the grace, sorry, it is the grounds of salvation and should be of the Christian life. The oneness of mind to which Paul calls his readers is not that they will agree on every single theological point, but it is a shared recognition of the priority and the primacy of Christ and of grace over against their differences. In Paul's letter to the Romans, his concern is to present the gospel he preached, but he also has another concern. It is to take this opportunity to once again emphasize that in spite of the tensions that exist in the church, that must exist, what does Paul say? There must be heresies among you. There must exist those ten tensions which arose because of cultural backgrounds and starkly different understandings of the gospel and of its practical implications, in spite of them, they must retain oneness, unity. Actually, I, I would invite you to follow this word all in Paul's letter to the Romans. I've just done a little bit of it with you this morning to see that this is something that touches the very woof and fiber of everything that Paul has to say in that letter. Now, grace as the basis of salvation and of Christian life is dependent upon something even more important. It's dependent upon the sufficiency of that source, who is Christ himself. If Christ is not, as the letter to the Hebrews put it, by one sacrifice sanctified forever those who come to God through him, then grace is not sufficient for salvation because it, it, it can't obtain full, uh, full forgiveness. It can't secure true sanctification. It can't ensure ultimate glorification. It becomes, therefore, an unstable basis for salvation and therefore also for fellowship. Again, I'll be saying this repeatedly this morning. The unity of the body of Christ in the teeth of difference is a declaration of the sufficiency and primacy of Jesus Christ, the Son of God. And division is a denial of that sufficiency. Now, I hope I don't have to argue the point and merely present it, that Paul insists upon Christ's sufficiency. He tells us it is such that, well, you know the passage, God, those whom he foreknew, he predestined to be conformed to the image of his Son, in order that he, that is the Son, might be the firstborn among many brothers. But he not only predestined, but he secured. Those whom he predestined, he called. And those whom he called, he justified. And those whom he justified, he also, what? Glorified. All whom the Father gave the Son will come to him. And he will not lose a single one of them. It's on those solid grounds of grace accomplished and secured that Paul can say that nothing can separate us from the love of God which is in Christ Jesus our Lord. And therefore he celebrates. What should we say to these things? 
If God is for us, who can be against us? So you see that our unity or our lack thereof have tremendously large implications. This is really a, a, a marvelous gospel, is it not? This is something where we can, we can rest, we can relax. We, we just sang it. I hope we believed what we sang. We can rest in Him because the gospel is God's very power to save, to forgive, to cleanse of guilt, to transform and, and to unite all who believe. The gospel includes all, regardless of race and cultural background or whatever else it might be, regardless of language. And so why do we divide into language-based congregations? Regardless of, uh, of culture, so why do we divide into cultural-based congregations? Sweet brethren, forgive me for saying, we are denying the gospel by such divisions, rather than overcoming them. The church should exemplify the power and the beauty and the inclusiveness of the gospel in its everyday life. If sin cannot reign because God's grace is sure, how can we refuse grace to those who differ from us simply because they differ? Now, we could say, yes, well, that's all nice, but I mean, there, were, there are real differences between us. Well, it, you've just discovered America. <laughs> Do you think that the it, tensions in the early church were any smaller? And yet, was the Church of Christ in the days of the apostles divided? We even have uh, white-collar churches and blue-collar churches. We have Pentecostal churches and Baptist churches and Presbyterian churches and Korean-speaking churches and Russian-speaking churches. And in those days, in spite of the tensions, and I'll describe them in a moment, the church was one visibly, practically, actually. The world saw that and they said, see how they love one another. And it wasn't easy to live in one church, no easier then than it is now. What was different was the early Christians' view of the church compared to ours. They did not view the church as a club in which members decide whether others may join or not. Or a club to which we decide if we want to join or not. They viewed the church as the realm of God's sovereign grace in Christ. He alone ruled in the church, and he did so by his spirit, according to his word. And Christians knew that by virtue of being Christian, they willy-nilly belonged to the body of Christ, to that one body. And because of this understanding, the early church was far better equipped to live together in the face of those differences than we are today. In those days, Jews spent very little time in the company of Gentiles, and I'm understating the case. Certainly they would not eat their food. They despised the Romans for their idolatry, for their promiscuous behavior for their dietary indulgence, for their worship of Caesar. And Romans, well, they despised the Jews for their perceived prudery and their strange dietary habits and their practice of circumcision and their faith in an unseen God and their apparent standoffishness. Still worse, Jews refused to swear by the genius of Caesar or perform civic duty by worshiping at his altar. Although not all slaves were treated with the kind of cruelty that we usually associate with slavery, slave owners in Rome had every legal right to dispose of their slaves as they deemed fit. 
Slaves were used for the gratification of sexual desires. Uh, their bodies for the polishing of utensils and their children for the promotion of their owner's wealth, not their parents' happiness. And any owner could kill his slaves for any reason or for no reason at all. And for lack of time, I, 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 I can't describe the differences between men and women just to say that women had very few legal rights. And they were considered the possession of their parents until their marriage, and then the possession of their husbands after they were married. And they were given away, and divorces were, were as common as, as marriages. No, they were more common. Baby girls were often considered a liability and therefore disposed of amongst the Romans in the city dump upon their birth. All of this was done away in Christ. Jews and Gentiles, men and women, slaves and slave owners became brothers and sisters in the faith, equal in all respects. They shared the same status. They were united by a, a mutual regard one for another. They belonged to the same kingdom. They were governed by, by the same divine laws and, and they were recipients of the same wonderful grace. So side by side, they worshiped the same God whom they jointly addressed as Father. They rejoiced in the same hope as they aspired together with one another for holiness and evermore of his presence whose presence they were privileged to experience when they worshipped together as one body. That's why Paul says that it is with all the saints, I quote, and only with all the saints, that we are able to comprehend the width and length and height and depth and to know, to know the love of Christ which surpasses knowledge. Thus, being filled with all the fullness of God, together as one. And so the church amazed both, both Jewish and Roman worlds by their contra-cultural norms and by the practical way in which Christians overrode distinctions and, and practiced a kind of cohesion for which the world longed but had never seen. Men and women uh, slaves and slave owners were acknowledged to have been created in the image of God and therefore accorded equal honor and protection. We experienced this in Israel where our church was made up of, of, of Jews and Arabs. And of course, the divides between us were extremely painful, real. Imagine a bus blowing up in Jerusalem or in Tel Aviv with scores injured and killed and the next day a Jew and an Arab sitting side by side worshiping God together. And you know uh, these social and practical differences were not the only kind of differences that existed in the early church. But they refused to accept the priority of those differences over against Christ. Let me give you one very, very strong example, stark example. Paul and Peter, they disagreed over conduct and practice. Uh, and their, their disagreement was the product of conflicting views and uh, uh, an emphasis on how they understood the faith. They were so real that Paul actually challenged Peter, accusing him, I quote, Galatians chapter 2, verse 14, of behaving in, in ways that contradict the gospel. He says that that behavior is in verse 2 of chapter, sorry, verse 11 of chapter 2, condemnable. He says that this behavior is hypocritical, chapter 14. Not quite... Uh, how to win friends and influence people. And, and uh, lest we think that that is all, Paul goes on to imply that Peter was nullifying the grace of God, implying that Christ died to no purpose. I mean, could you think of a, a, a greater difference 
a, a, a clearer denial of the gospel. And yet, neither Peter nor Paul chose to break away from one another and establish separate churches and denominations. In fact, we have no indication that Peter said, how can you speak to me like that? I'm offended. There was none of this. Because they both loved Christ. And they loved the church more than they loved themselves. And they knew that they belonged to one another in Christ. And therefore, they refused to take umbrage. Imagine how a modern day Christian would respond if Paul came to him with such accusations. What is more, Paul did it publicly because Peter's sin was public. And yet, they chose to serve alongside one another and work out their differences. And we later find Peter obviously correcting himself because he defends Paul's position in Acts chapter 15. You see, once again, Christ loomed larger in their eyes than their differences. They knew that the basis of their fellowship was grace, not agreement, not language, not a shared culture or, or anything else. And they paid more than lip service to this uh, understanding of the primacy of Christ. More than lip service to the understanding that Christ has but one body, but one church. That God has but one kingdom to which they all belonged, whether they liked it or one another or not. And therefore they learned to like it and to love one another. They chose to live out the gospel in the face of their differences. And once again they amazed the world by the love that they demonstrated. Dear sisters and brothers, this is our calling. But to be honest, the world is not amazed by us, unless it is, once again, by our frictions, our denominations, and our divisions, by the inanity of our moral standards and the speed by which we embrace the world's norms. The church is no longer contra-cultural. It apes the world in style, it apes the world in conduct, and it apes the world in standards. And instead of living out the gospel of grace, it prefers to divide and so-called love one another over the fences it has created. It is high time for the church to revert to being the church of God holding forth the word of life in the midst of an increasingly crooked and perverse generation. It's high time that we forsook our respective fiefdoms and chose to live and labor together for the glory of God. Behold how good and pleasant it is for brethren to dwell together in unity. It's like the precious oil running on the head, running down Aaron's beard, running down to the collar of his robes. It's like the dew of Hermon on the mountains of Zion. Why? Because there, there, the Lord has commanded his blessing. Even life forevermore. In other words, something of eternity is savored when we live together in unity. It is high time for the church once again to become unworldly, otherworldly, God and God's kingdom oriented. It is high time for us to be one as the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit are one, so that the world might know that the Father sent the Son to be the Savior of the world. It is high time for the church to dare be the church again. Now, I, I very much hope I've established in your mind a, a, a firm understanding of this mandate of, of unity. And we don't want to stay too long. You know what the proverb says in that. Uh, and so, on the other hand, we, we can't just leave without some practicalities. And so, I would like to try to just give 
some thoughts in this matter. Now, of course, we are not facing a blank slate. The church today is divided over every single issue one can imagine and some one cannot. We have uh, pro-vaxxers and anti-vaxxers, pro-maskers and anti-vaxxers, uh, maskers. We have uh, language-based and so on. We've already indicated so many. Satan is having a heyday. To ignore reality is to negate any likelihood of uh, our being able to change it or challenge it. Uh, to think that reality can be uh, changed in one sweep is, is irresponsibly foolish. And I may be foolish, but I hope I am not irresponsibly so. All too many interests, organizational and personal, including our own, are invested in the present situation. What is more, we have very little practice in living alongside those who differ significantly from us. We are used to uh, huddling in our self-created enclaves and, uh, with those who like us and whom therefore we like because they like us. We dread the thought of emerging out of our, our comfort zone and allowing others to threaten the false security which we have created at the expense of the gospel. Now, I don't know, it may be that nothing short of a, revelation, a revolution is needed, but the trouble is that revolutions entail fatalities, and I'm not sure that that is the most appropriate way for us to go for the cause of Christ. And surely, love for all the brethren should disincline us to revolution, lest we leave any behind. But the cause is more important than human comfort. And I don't know, maybe, maybe the only recourse is a, revelation, a revolution. Uh, I don't know. Uh, who will lead it? Uh, who will follow? Uh, the answers to those questions are certainly beyond me. But we can start where we are, and we can start thinking about the practical implications of our own oneness of Christ in terms of the local congregation to which we belong and to our personal circumstances. Uh, believe me, there's enough there to occupy us for the duration of our lives and yet some. Take, for example, Paul's injunction in Philippians chapter 2, verses 1 to 4. If there is any encouragement in Christ, is there? If there's any love or comfort from love, is there? If there's any sharing of the Spirit, do we share in the Spirit? Is there any affection and sympathy? Do we have any such? Complete my joy, asks Paul of the Philippians, by being of the same mind. We've already talked about that. Having the same love. Being in full accord. Do nothing from selfish ambition or conceit. But in humility, count others more significant than yourselves. Ouch. Let each of you look not only to his own interests, but also to the interests of others. And then you remember the amazing example that Paul gives us. Christ himself, who stripped himself of all the glory of his deity, became one of us and humbled himself, not only to death, but to the death of the cross. Selfishness is a real threat to our oneness in Christ. And Paul calls upon us to consciously cultivate an awareness of and a sensitivity to each other's needs. And such an awareness can only be the product of communal life, where congregants visit and host one another, where they share various activities, not all of them spiritual, where they assist one another in the course of life and create the kind of friendship that enables them to both share and identify each other's needs so that they can reach out to one another. All too many people in churches are like ships passing in the night. Their faces are familiar. 
But unless they have stood before the congregation, and maybe after a while even then, their, uh, their addresses are unknown, uh, their names are forgotten, and nobody knows their joys, their conflicts, their successes, or their sorrows. Love involves involvement. Sympathy, common interests, and share understandings are, are the product of the, of the give and take of communal life. And the livelier such a, a, a shared life becomes, the more productive and the more likely it is to create the kind of goodwill and affectionate camaraderie that renders selfish ambition and conceit less likely. And that equips us to give frank expression to our differences in a loving and an edifying manner. What is more, they enable us not only to teach each other, but believe it or not, learn from each other, glean from each other's perspective, and live out the gospel of grace. I urge you, Paul says, to walk in a manner worthy of the calling to which you have been called. What does that mean? Oh, it means being very spiritual, being long in prayer, having morning devotions, coming to church. No, says Paul. With all humility and gentleness, with patience, bearing one another in love, eager to maintain the unity of the Spirit in a bond of peace. There is one body, one Spirit, just as you were called to one hope that belongs to your call, one Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God and Father of us all, who is over all and through all and in all, regardless of the language they speak or their theological views. But grace was given to each one of us according to the measure of Christ. Do not grieve the Holy Spirit of God by whom you were sealed for the day of redemption. How not to? Let all bitterness and wrath and anger and clamor and slander be put away from you along with all mal malice. Be kind to one another, tender hearted, forgiving one another as God in Christ has forgiven you. Now, Inevitably, necessarily, there will be differences among us. But such differences are the opportunity for growth and for grace. And so long as we share those fundamentals, nothing else should be a cause for separation. If my wife and I separated every time I dared to think in ways that differed from her, I would have died a thousand deaths and been separated a million times. But why do we consider the bond of the Spirit, sealed with the blood of Christ, any less sacred than a marriage? Yes, we differ. We, we prefer different hymnody. We have different social backgrounds and so on and so forth. But there is one body and one Spirit. We read it. There's one hope and one God and Father who is in all. What is more, grace was given to each one of us according to the measure of Christ's gift. God made us differ, and he made us differ for our purpose. There are varieties of gifts, but the same Spirit works in them all. We are united for the common good, and this is the beauty of the body of Christ. United with one another, because they're united for the glory of God. Sharing with one heart and one mind and one longing to be holy together and beautiful together in Christ in spite of their differences and realizing that they can only be holy and beautiful together. Recognizing that we need each other in order to grow and therefore we should stubbornly hold on to each other. Recognizing that the Fullness of the stature of Christ can only be found in the context of a binding church relationship. Now, this is not to play down our differences. Rather, we should discuss our differences precisely because we love truth and we love one another. We should be engaged in speaking the truth in bold, courageous love so that we grow up in every way together in him who is the head, who is Christ. And this means that some of those who differ from us may well have a distinct contribution to make to our own walk with the Lord. 
we need to recognize that our duty is to love, not to be loved. We need to recognize that being loved is not a right. Humility. A determined refusal to think of ourselves more highly than we ought to think will enable us to listen to one another with honest goodwill, study the other person's position, and grow together. Yes, we won't all come to the same opinion. But we will come to the same Christ. And in the, in the consequence of living together, over the course of time, rather than this culture of division, a new culture will emerge. One that will truly focus on Christ and give him the glory that is his. And we will be transformed by each other because we are all in need of transformation. We all need to be sanctified. We all need to be challenged. We all need to venture out of our respective comfort zones so as to grow in Christ. And brethren, sisters and brothers, if we are not challenged, we shall not be sanctified. And unless we are willing to learn from one another in sacrificial ways, we will be unable to reflect the beauty and the power of the gospel. We'll be unable to reflect the wonder of grace or the nature of the kingdom of God. And to that end, Paul prayed, May the God of endurance and encouragement grant you to live in such harmony with one another, in accord with Jesus Christ, that together, with one voice, you may glorify God, the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. And therefore, we come again to the verse that I quoted in Romans 15, 7, therefore, welcome one another as Christ has welcomed you to the glory of God. That is my prayer. I hope it is yours. Let's pray. God of grace, you who looked upon s sinful and rebellious mankind and still chose to send your son to be the savior of the world. We, we bow before the, the beauty of your grace. And, and shamefacedly we confess that we display all too little of that grace to one another. We obscure the glory of the gospel and the, and the primacy of Christ by our divisions. We do not reach out to others in self-denying kindness. Instead, we're inclined to accept others on condition that they embrace our points of view. Lord, we adore the beauty of your kindness. And we dare ask that you would work in our hearts so that we become channels of that kindness to others. We ask for grace to honor you with our lives by, by exemplifying the gospel of grace in a world torn by self-interest. Grant us the same mind that was in Christ Jesus when he assumed our guilt and bore its punishment. Grant us to live out the fellowship of the Spirit by sharing a, a, a common desire to glorify Christ together. Evoke in us the determination to do nothing from selfishness or empty conceit, but to humbly and sincerely consider one another more important than ourselves. Lord, may our light shine in such a way that those who know us will glorify you our blessed Father who is in heaven. This we ask for Jesus' sake. Amen.